Good evening and welcome to Forum Europa. I'm Amir Krivoshia. And I'm Ivana Dragicevic. The Berlin process, which was launched three years ago, was labeled by some as the good cup for the Balkans and the good cup for Balkans European integration. At this year's summit at Trieste, Angela Merkel, Emmanuel Macron and Paolo Gentiloni in a way started, stated that political stability of the region is also political stability for the EU. But the big break likes in the political re leadership of the countries of the Western Balkans themselves. Did the Berlin process work as pre-accession boost for the countries in the region or is it so, just sort of a carrot for the Balkans while EU deals with its own issues? So what worked and what did not work within this Berlin process? We talk today with our guests. Uh, I'm very honored to welcome Angelina Eichhorz, Director for Western Europe, Western Balkans and Turkey at European External Action Service. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Ms. Hedwig Morvai, Director of European Fund for the Balkans, our partner in this program. Welcome. Here we have Knut Fleckenstein, member of the European Parliament. Welcome to the show. Good evening. And also member of the European Parliament, Tanya Fion. <coughs> welcome to the show. Thank you. Good evening. So, be let's start <laughs> with Berlin, but with not Berlin. the Berlin process. Yeah, <laughs> Mr. Fleckenstein, let's start with you. We had a uh, in Berlin. We had a process last week, uh, and the elections in Germany will be the topic in the next days. So, what uh, should uh, Western Balkan countries? expect from the uh, results of the elections in Germany, meaning the Berlin process? Countries. Well, it, it's not easy to say today because first we have to see whether the Chancellor will really be able to form a government with Liberals and Greens. I think that she will and uh, at the end uh, not big changes, I would mm -hmm. say. They'll keep it like that. I, I think so, yeah. Uh, Ms. Eishorst, you were together with uh, Commissioner Mogherini, one of the hosts of this uh, recent dinner uh, on the margins of uh, General Assembly of the UN with, with our political re leaders of Western Balkans. So basically, uh, as some of the analysis of European Fund for the Balkans say that the leaders are the biggest uh, break for, for reforms in the region, so what do you do to them on these dinners? <laughs> How does it what look we do like? to them. Um, first, we we want to make sure that they, as much as possible, meet together, all six around mm -hmm. the table. That was very much an objective of the High Representative, Commissioner Hahn as well. And I think that's part of the whole regional set when you go to Trieste, Berlin, Vienna, Paris. But not just that. I mean, they, and they've been saying themselves, the leaders, we have not met that often as we have since the last two years. They get to know each other far better, there's more trust, and that means that there is a mechanism that when there are issues mm -hmm. between them or with us, it can be more easily solved because you have this mechanism of uh, contacts, contacts constantly. Second, um, the High Representative really had a very important message this time, she always has, but she has been saying, you know, for her, the Western Balkan Six is a key priority. Now she still has a mandate until end of 2019. Next elections come up in 2019. Um, she really wants to help as much as possible all six to make irreversible steps. So for the next commission to be sure that we can advance really, you know, as deep and as far as possible with all six. And I think what she then asked, just to finish on it from the leaders, is their, their full commitment. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we are in this together. It's you, but it's first and foremost the people of the region as well. They have to feel that there are really results and that there is really work going on. It never stopped. It always has been very deep for the whole region. But I think now we're getting into an, an even, a, a different gear even for the next 12 to 18 months. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a question for Hedwig and Ms. Fayon can, can answer, but it's, it can be a question for all of them. We heard in President Juncker's uh, State of the Union very clear message that it is yes to enlargement, not during this commission, but in some further period, but with strict, uh, uh, how to say, abiding to the rules of enlargement, enlargement process. So uh, do you at the end, concerning what Ms. Eichhor said, uh, see this and political will and changes finally in the region uh, to follow this criteria 
in still very complicated political situation as in case of Bosnia and relations of uh, Pristina and Belgrade. Maybe time, but yeah. Ms. Fayon can Ms. Fayon. start. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's difficult to assess now how much change we can really see. If I look from the perspective of Brussels, my impression is that enlargement, there is a higher awareness of the danger what might happen in the Western Balkan if. if we don't put enlargement high back on the agenda. In the last few weeks and months, we clearly saw better engagement. Also, as you said, of Federica Mogherini, she clearly stated, I want to have results by the end of my mandate. Also, Jean-Claude Juncker said enlargement is a top priority. What I was puzzled a little bit, and I think also in the region was, why only two countries were in the same speech seen as we might push ahead with Serbia and Montenegro. I think we should stick to clear reform path, make the whole process not only political, but also the way how the governments are communicating it, that to feel that the citizens feel better engaged and that feel that these are tangible results. All these reforms can influence on their lives and make their lives better. It's not a homework to satisfy Brussels, but to continue to make, I don't know, healthy environment for foreign investments, to open and create new jobs. What we see now in the whole region is very much in common. A lot of despair, especially among young generation, young people are leaving the countries. And I think there are quite some tendencies that should worry us. One element that I could maybe open in the, our future discussion is a lot of open bilateral issues. Yeah. And I see that countries might, in the future accession process, start blocking each other. The same as and this can be yeah. additional problem to the accession negotiations. We will have to seriously see how to deal with it. So how do you see it and how can you make maybe the political leaders politically accountable for, for this, for respecting the, the criteria? Well, yes, I think what uh, Ms. Fayon was saying leads us back to the Berlin process, because I think that the Berlin process was, at the right moment, a very nice addition to the existing accession process, because in that time, at least for us in the European Fund for the Balkans, uh, we were conducting different analyses on the states uh, in the region and on the state of the accession process, and we somehow concluded that business as usual doesn't work. So something must change, because the process is, takes so much time and the changes in the environment are so huge in the region, in Europe, in the EU, but also in the world. Globally, yeah. Global changes that we have to adopt to the new circumstances. And I think that the Berlin process was therefore so much welcomed by the political leadership in the region, as well as just from uh, by other actors, because it started insisting on some very important issues which pop up, popped up in the region as crucial. Uh, the bilateral uh, issues were mentioned and it was the great success of the Vienna summit and we participated in drafting the declaration which was signed by the ministers of foreign affairs of the six Western Balkan countries. And we hope that uh, this agreement and um, this issue will maintain in the Berlin process as something crucial because um, I think that it was shown that such a framework can much easier approach such highly sensitive and complicated problems as solving bilateral issues than it is possible in bilateral uh, um, in bilateral discussions mm -hmm. and in bilateral processes. So, <coughs> therefore, I think that the Berlin process should be considered as something very important and as an addition to the existing mm -hmm. accession process and to consider its future development, because obviously 2018 was put as the end uh, in the first uh, uh, vision of, of this process, uh, which was launched uh, in, in, in Berlin in 2014. Uh, so now we have to see how to continue with it. And I think that should be the key, to see where it complements the existing accession mm -hmm. process and where it can add these useful elements which will solve issues in the region, which will then foster the accession process mm -hmm. Yes, but Ms. Morway, this is the... The second part of 2017, and you, you mentioned commitment 
but what does the commitment, the showed commitment from the leaders of Germany, France, Italy mean? I mean, we, we remember the photos of Miss Merkel from the first summit in Berlin with, at that time, prime ministers of Serbia and Croatia, uh, Milanovic and Vucic, looking at the maps. But that's the only thing that we still remember. No concrete roads or railways. Or um, well, yes, that's, mm -hmm. that's one of the uh, main uh, part of the process which is criticized a lot because it, re it requires the most investments in every sense, not only material, but also political engagement. And what we uh, uh, insist on is that it also requires uh, a, a wide consensus in all these countries consensus and support by the citizens because such huge uh, projects and investments and demanding processes cannot be achieved without a wider consensus and a broader consensus. So yes, we can of course um, uh, hold accountable the regional leadership for not maybe delivering more, but I think it's a, it's a very complex issue. On the other hand, there are some tangible results. I mean, the, the Regional Youth Cooperation Office, yeah, we'll which of course still has to show that it works. It and is to be being tender. set up, we'll yes. We'll um, and the declaration signed, and at, at least the goodwill was shown for starting solving bilateral issues. And I think that uh, while being crit critical, we also have to be realistic and consider this as as um, uh, 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 a very important momentum for somehow creating a more positive atmosphere in the region for supporting regional cooperation and to design the process, the follow-up of the process in a way to be able to monitor uh, the progress in some of these very crucial uh, projects and initiatives which are part of it. Mr. So. Fleckenstein. We you wanted to react. This I think we should be a bit patient at least. Mm -hmm. I understand perfectly that people, for example, in Albania or in other places, are a bit fed up with all these news uh, discussion, discussion between uh, commission and, and, and government, and nothing really happens. Some reforms, yeah, the newspapers are full of, full of uh, judiciary reform. But at the end, nobody on the street really feels the difference mm -hmm. because it's not so far. And the Berlin process was meant also as to set some milestones on the way. And I would not say that uh, Jews exchange, uh, the fact that around Trieste, some hundred companies were meeting each other, creating the, the realistic, uh, at least fundament uh, to show also for foreign investors, this is one Stay market off. and not six little marketplaces here. Uh, it needs also time. And uh, my only point is that I'm a bit afraid that at the very end of all the bigger projects, we find out that we need money. So this is our task as well, mm. now to speak about money because uh, Without European money, uh, it would not uh, really be a sufficient result. Yeah. So you mentioned the economy. Maybe we can yeah. skip to that because so-called Berlin Plus was one of the most important things yeah. that were that were presented. Uh, that was presented, and it was framed as new Balkans uh, 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 Marshall Plan. So, uh, how to what Mr. Fleckenstein was saying? You know that some pre-accession and some other European funds are available, especially for infrastructure projects. Uh, how to kind of materialize it at the end? It's true that we need, with the vision now we have, as was put forward by President of the Commission, it helps us really, you know, when you look up to 2025, mm -hmm. it helps us all actually to argue even better for now the money is needed, but still before the money, what, what I see, what we are lacking is, as was said before, people in the Balkan don't feel the European Union enough, but also inside the European Union, people of the EU don't feel enough how important it is to be fully, fully, fully connected and open and interacted with the Balkan. I mean, and then really allow me to just make a side note, but look at the potential investment, tourism. I mean, it's a fantastic destination for all six, and it's not just uh, one particular 
country that but managed to promote it. You cannot travel by plane from one capital <laughs> to another. You cannot, indeed. Example. There are the connections, the telephone connections, and everything that is really... But the huge potential there is, the huge potential with, with youth, of investments, of companies attracting a foreign direct investment also from the EU. And I, I see... Well, I, I'm a European, but I'm born in the Netherlands. My, in the Netherlands, people don't really feel the, the positive side enough of what is the potential out there. So also the leaders within the European Union, the heads of state and government, have to promote more why it is so important. It's a win-win for everybody to have the Balkans in together as one European family. When you do that, I think it's easier to, to also argue for the very necessary budget and investments, as, as you were saying. It is, yes, it is not easy at all because there are many priorities globally, regionally and and. Um, but this, we have to constantly show that this is an investment for life. It's an investment for the good. What we invest together in the Western Balkan 6, we all benefit from. Um, plus, uh, as a European, I say, why would I deny the citizens in Western Balkan 6 all the goods and the services we are having within the European Union as full members? Um, you know, it's, it's very important that we also feel that part of, of solidarity together. Yes, but we're discussing uh, the infrastructure. Uh, do you know that there is no uh, plain line between Sarajevo and Skopje? <laughs> yes. And, and for example, you know, the Berlin process started in 2014. Since then, uh, since then in Bosnia, a single meter of a highway hasn't been built mm. on a so-called uh, famous pan uh, pan European, European yeah. Corridor 5C. How do you comment that? Yeah, these are these are very serious issues which we address also. I mean, we are. Meter. There are there are a number of elements that have Whom not been implemented. No. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, just I, I, I'm not accusing. No, no, asking, asking just telling that you. That. Okay. We are talking about political will of the leaders in the region and all these intertwining EU policies and stuff like that. So basically, you know, who who is responsible yeah, yeah. for that? We know. Um, maybe it's difficult to point with the finger who is responsible, but what I often face in the region, to also bring some criticism to the regional leadership, not only to the EU or lack that of money or so. That was our introduction, that's what we are Exactly, discussing. it's that quite often you feel with the current political elites that exist, that for them actually the, the status quo not go much too fast to the EU because that means painful reforms including rule of law, justice, which if you think about corruption in high political elites can harm many of them. And without it's that the there is no investment quo, it's basically. Maybe because... simply mm -hmm. better for them. So what is the real commitment of the leaders in the region? I think it's very good to ask also because this it is a concern. On one hand, I also see a concern that in European Union, you know, well, we for the last few years struggled with several crises, and now we are in, I would say, at a very important cross point. Mm. What kind of union we will build pursue. in the future, yeah. pursue. Mm. But to be very frank, if I'm coming from the region, Western Balkans or Slovenia, in between as a bridge, I think we have so many common challenges, and we all countries are part of Europe. I don't see other alternative than build the bridges and work together to fight these common challenges, being terrorism, migration, uh, corruption or economy, jobs and so on. So I think the leaders in the region have a huge responsibility to communicate for these reforms that on the other hand also make healthy environment for the investments or for the EU money. And not to forget there is quite a significant mm -hmm. European money on the ground, mm -hmm. quite a significant yes. also from the bank. So quite often we see the, the Western Balkan becoming a, a playground for different geopolitical interests, money coming from Arabs, from China, from Turkey. Um, Turkey. But it's also, it's also European money then, but maybe weekly. Um, communicate. <laughs> Mr. Juncker also stated in his speech that it's transparency of investments, especially in certain fields as infrastructure, energy, which are considered as strategic, are now the security question for Europe in, in this sense. I wanted to, you reacted, Mr. Fleckenstein, uh, you've mentioned this several hundred businessmen that were gathering around Trieste. So basically, business forum, civil society, uh, were organized also as a part of Berlin process. Mm. So did this 
bottom-up pressure made any any kind of effect on, on governments at all? I think so. Mm -hmm. If they mm -hmm. see how many companies are at least uh, looking for partners, uh, discussing which chances they have, even if they find out that in a special case there is no chance, they know the reason why there is no chance and where to go on to, to give uh, a, a, to create a better uh, development, but uh, also in a positive way. I think mm. there are a lot of companies si sitting together today and uh, thinking about how cooperation can start, how mm -hmm. to create this win-win situation. Yep. That's fine. Uh, yeah, but yeah. also I just, when I sometimes hear also a bit different stories from companies that would like to invest mm. and enter in some countries, but they have difficulties because a yeah, lot yeah. of barriers, corruption and so corruption, on. Yeah. And this is Wind what I'm saying to improve this healthy environment for investments and business to come. So. Yeah. Well, society maybe, yeah. yeah just if I may, uh -huh. it's definitely Trieste was a perhaps even a turning point in terms of bringing in much more business and civil society than before in the, in the Berlin process. This is very true and we need to do much, much more of that. Um, but what I was uh, saying in terms of the companies coming in, one issue they face, uh, they all tell us all, um, is the brain drain of young mm -hmm. skilled labor, labor leaving the area and they really, they need skilled young people, well, young and old, but everybody who can actually be there as a skilled labor force. That's, that's one of the areas. We are also asking the leaders very clearly to focus on that. These should be your priorities. Of course, it's rule, and, rule of law, fundamental rights, fundamental freedoms, no doubt, it's crucial. But you need skilled labor force as well to attract yeah. uh, investors. Yes, but Ms. Eichhorst, uh, what are the EC mechanisms to hold political leaders who committed themselves to the EU path uh, accountable? Well, you know, we had, if I may, we had an example in Trieste where the Transport Community Treaty mm -hmm. was not signed by all parties and we were very clear to the party not signing that there will be consequences if this is not resolved and that would mean basically that people will not benefit from everything that is foreseen under the Transport Community Treaty. That was the main topic treaty. in Bosnia-Herzegovina for days, I imagine, for a month. Or... I imagine. Now it, is, it has been resolved. This is good. Part of it <laughs> has been resolved. This is excellent. This is excellent. But it doesn't need to, do, to take two, three months to be resolved. It, uh, it could have been done in Trieste and we could have already started working. <clears throat> you see, we are ready to operate. We operate 24-7 and we want the leaders also to operate 24-7. The whole machi min the machinery of the Commission is ready day and night to just make sure to support where it is needed. And we need some of that energy and speed and commitment. It's there. Uh, I think it's a lot among the people. Uh, definitely. I'm not here to criticize the leadership, but it is very important that everybody is in this together. Uh, yeah. We need to work. I it's hard I have work. I to say something. Last, last week, I mean, I think it was on Friday, last Friday, Commissioner Hahn has sent a letter in which he claims that without adopting excise law in the Parliament of Bosnia-Herzegovina, there cannot be use of EU money that was assigned in, in Trieste. That's the last information. Why is that? We have been very clear on the need to adopt the excise tax legislation. Until this very moment, we are very clear this has to be adopted. And this is an ongoing discussion we have with the authorities in Sarajevo. Very yeah. important. And I think that it's really important that the people know who is bringing the money or who is uh, guilty that money yeah. accountable that the money is not coming mm -hmm. and we are sometimes too nice we should make that very more clear that we do it now on the other hand i think the instruments we are using to show the people that we really want them in one day are also not enough and not good enough the question of civil society uh, also uh, raises up because all the leaders of the region were during uh, and through the Berlin process kind of committed to involve civil society in the decision making process and everything. But in nation states or in states in the region we have 
very difficult situation still with pressures on some NGOs, pressures on media. So how do you see it from your perspective? Well, yes, it's, it's also part of this new reality in the Balkans that, again, civil society is considered the enemy in some of the co countries. And um, that is why the civil society of the region gathered around the Berlin mm. process to use the platform in order to insist on citizen participation when it comes to decisions which are affecting the region. And we would like to somehow exercise and practice this communication and cooperation with our governments within this process, because we consider it flexible enough, enough but attractive enough to our politicians uh, so that they could find ways how to accept civil society. Um, because there is, we have, to, we have to see that there is a huge expertise lying in the civil society which could be used in most of the areas which are covered by the Berlin process. So what we are trying to do here is, as civil society, to appear as partners. So we are offer, offer, offering partnership and cooperation with the governments. Of course, civil society has to show that it has an added value to the process, that it can really take part in the political process. Um, and that is why we are trying to structure this is involvement of the civil society within the civil society forum as an exercise where we are trying to provide policy recommendations to start discussing with our political leadership about the issues which are on the agenda of the Berlin process, but also to offer them assistance in achieving this wider consensus, social consensus, which is necessary for delivering with some, some of the commitments uh, which were made within the process. And I would like just to add a bit on, on, on this discussion, what was going on, because uh, you asked about how to hold our politicians accountable. Oh. Well, it is all about the accession process. Uh, there are mechanisms. Uh, however, as I stated earlier, I think that this process has to be a bit adjusted and reformed, knowing now how this goes in the region. Um, and I think that uh, there were many criticisms towards, for example, towards the uh, Commission reports, progress reports. And I think that that criticism should be taken very much seriously by the Commission. When, when people say, uh, please name and shame those who do not deliver, then I think it's very important because so far these progress reports have been translated by our politicians very freely. These were formulated in a way that each of them could underline and, and emphasize the parts which were beneficial uh, and not so much uh, deal with, with the parts which, are, which were critical. And that is why the public is not really getting the real picture, the real feedback uh, from Brussels, what is going on. Yeah. And we do need that if the public has to put pressure on the governments to yes. deliver. Yes, but let's not talk about the politicians only, I mean, but continue to discuss economy. Uh, Ms. Fayan, you said that Slovenia, including Croatia, is a kind of a bridge for the Western Balkans to, to European, uh, to Europe, and it's expected to have a double economic growth, but how you can expect uh, economic growth with such a uh, huge unemployment rate currently, and the only ambition of the young people, and not only of them, is to work in the public sector. I mean, if I look back in Slovenia, we are now really in the moment that our economy is picking up and we have a very good prognosis um, with uh, economic growth. But that requires, I would say, years of heavy reforms also. We went through a difficult period. Mm -hmm. This is very much the question also how the government at home will manage to structure reforms. We started um, initiatives, economic, social initiatives in Bosnia and Herzegovina to make a boost and continue with this path because, as you said yourself, it's a high unemployment rate, young people are living, so there is a high demand to make this economy and um, <coughs> environment healthy and efficient. So I think this is a lot with the support, of course, of the EU um, on the, in the hands of the government at home, what is the commitment and then also implementation of these reforms. What do you think, Mr. Fleckenstein? No, I think it, it's right. It, you, you need these reforms and it's not possible to do it from, from one day to the other. And you know, in, in, in some regions, 
We, we have to speak about property rights and the basis even, uh, which must be mm. clear if some investment is expected. Mm. And uh, so it's also about us, how we help to do that reforms maybe, but first of all, it's a quest, the pace is a question of how governments at home do their homework. Maybe to withdraw yeah. just a second, you, have, you wanted to add something? No, just on, on the economy, no. because I think it's, it's a, it, the, the picture is a little brighter than we see here, because the economy is picking up, also in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and, and we, we, we know these figures and we see them. It takes time, but these are definitely results of reforms that have been undertaken already, thanks to the support of the European Commission, European Union in general. And we shouldn't forget that because we cannot just portray this region as full of unemployment and everything is not going well there. And all of the leaders who present the results that have been also by previous governments achieved, you see there is a positive trend, as there is within the European Union as well. And we need to pick up on that, not just uh, leave aside what is not our, our key focus for today in general there there's a lot because when you go through accession you go through the whole lit a whole lit is the rule of law and that is that takes a lot of time because you go to the crux of the matter of state building yeah. <laughs> uh, and that takes time but uh, we see that um, the work is ongoing and we we just want it was said before that it is far <coughs> better explained locally what is really happening um, and I, I think on every evening, on every show, on every uh, outlet, on social media, you should have much more of the results of the work that has come out so far. Talking there is about, too little being explained here. And talking about explaining, maybe because at the beginning you've mentioned that uh, the enlargement is uh, named by Ms. Mogherini as one of her priorities until the end of her mandate. So maybe just to put enlargement in a larger picture globally concerning what EEAS does. And we saw kind of, uh, 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 how to say, importance of the region during the refugee crisis in 2015 and how maybe important it was to include all the players in EU policy making <coughs> in a way. So can you just explain to the public in the region so why the priority concerning global and wider and closer neighborhood challenges is important at this moment? Because, frankly, I believe that Mrs. Mogherini is very right when she says, as European Union, we have the biggest leverage in the region. We have all the instruments at hand, and not even enough, as you said. Um, and there could be much more of that. But we also, we have made a very clear commitment to all six. You are part of the European family. Um, and here, with, we have all the partnerships we need with, with the member states, with the United States, with others who are very, very focused on making sure that this region prospers. And the prosperity is totally a win-win. It is in our interest, but it's very much in the interest of the citizens there. And I think she sees that with every instrument or everything we have at hand, we can actually make the difference. So we should do that. We should focus on doing that. It is possible to be done. There are big problems in this world. Um, I also uh, could accompany the High Representative to the United Nations General Assembly, uh, where everything passes uh, uh, the table. Um, but still, out of all of that, she keeps on saying, we need collectively for the future of Europe to focus on Western Balkans. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, the next question is for everybody, but I will start with Ms. Morway. Uh, this is very important uh, thing in our region. At the beginning, politically again. Politically, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Before we start talking about young people and their future, at the beginning of the last year of the Berlin process in November of this year, two verdicts are expected in high-profile cases at Hague, at uh, ICTY, Ratko Mladic, and uh, Perlich and others. Mm -hmm. What kind of dynamics do you expect after them in Western Balkans? How would how it will affect the Berlin process. Ms. Fayon is reacting, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and relations in the region, but with focus on Bosnia and Herzegovina, which Especially. is in the, in the middle of, of, of Let's this not say what. verdict. You know yeah. why. <laughs> yes, well, well, we are repeating saying that um, the Berlin process gives a kind of a new boost for regional cooperation. On the other hand, at the same time, we are experiencing some very even strange dynamics 
bilateral dynamics um, between some of the countries in the previous months. Um, so I think it's very difficult to say because um, unfortunately still, and that is why we should insist so much on solving bilateral disputes on one mm. hand, mm. Uh, the smallest issue can become a huge political topic when it suits the political leaderships in one or the other of the countries. And even some issues which, which are considered being solved and put somewhere deep in some, 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 some uh, basket can be taken out again and re revitalized when there you is mean, some political interest. You mean especially interest. when you have elections nearby? Especially when there are local, I mean, elections in some of these countries. Sometimes they even think that these leaders have a kind of an agreement on attacking each other when it suits their domestic um, uh, election campaigns. Um, so I think it will again serve for having some, some bad dynamics in the region. We should be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, what we could also observe with regard to these previous um, um, uh, interactions and, and, and negative trends in the previous months uh, is that these are somehow getting resolved because on the other hand there is a new regional dynamic so even when there are some bilateral issues popping up there is this new regional momentum which somehow handles uh, the situation so uh, that is why I think we should insist on on deepening this regional interaction. And the, of course, the Berlin process is not the only one. Sometimes in the region, we say that our politicians or our prime ministers are meeting each other, the colleagues from the region more often than they meet their own cabinet. Yes. So I think this is this could be a good but balancing you, you mechanism. You have to admit this is a huge <laughs> yes. issue. I mean, this, this is yeah, I, I just wanted that. to add, I think we have almost 80 regional initiatives, or 90. 77, 90. 90, 90 already. So okay. they are growing. Um, but it's, all, it's good for for people's to people contacts and cooperation. If I come back to um, especially the issue of bilateral unresolved topics, you know, we have all borders unresolved. And you mentioned two court judgments that will happen. It will certainly change the dynamics in the region, as every court judgment so far did. did. Mm -hmm. But what is above the rule of law? That is for sure something we have to accept and try to calm down as much as possible the tensions. It's up to regional leaders how to deal with it. And nothing would actually help to go into more emotional atmosphere that already is there. Mm -hmm. It is a danger. But going to bilateral issues, I see we have a problem. Now, especially when I'm closely following arbitration agreement between Slovenia and Croatia, what is happening when one country doesn't respect the rule of law. Now we have Pelješac breach, we have um, Gradiška breach, we have unresolved borders, we have Kosovo-Montenegro um, opening demarcation process. So all these are extremely sensible questions that are on the table and I think we need to maybe in the region find some sort of mediation to put on the table all open bilateral issues, to define them, and through some soft mediation maybe, try to in parallel resolve them, because otherwise but we will have a problem with each country to join the EU. It because seems we know that they forget, will... because all the ministers of foreign affairs signed this declaration. In and... Vienna. Yeah, in Vienna. In Vienna. But if I may also to add, because you said that somehow these issues are being resolved somehow, there is a lot of work behind mm. that. And I, th I think we have now much more joined up diplomacy and political engagement than we had been mm -hmm. for, also from the European Parliament, because a lot of questions can actually be resolved through mediation, interaction, but also very much from the institutions. And that is the work, as you said, that is needed. It's the trust building, but it's also behind uh, the, you know, away from the cameras where people don't need to posture, basically try to resolve what is what needs to be resolved. Mm. Um, there is uh, mm. definitely more that needs to be done, but already if there are issues that have been avoided, if big clashes have been avoided, <laughs> it's also because of the lot of the work both uh, Mrs. Mogherini, Commissioner Hahn uh, have been investing in this. Mm -hmm. very and, much. I, and I think just one sentence, the bottom line, if you talk with people in the region, no one really wants new violence, 
or potentially yeah. new war that the memory is too fresh. I don't think this is the situation. But just to go, if you look last 20 or 30 years, it has been a significant process and changes doesn't happen over the night. And just to bridge it to our last subject, what Ms. Fayon said, and I think that youth which are escaping from the region, they're escaping much more this kind of atmosphere yes. than really, I'm you know, sure. yeah. <laughs> not but having yeah, jobs. Yeah, yeah, but talking about youth, Mr. Fleckenstein, you're from Germany, one of the biggest achievements of Berlin process is so-called Reich or, or Regional Youth Cooperation Office. I know that they have a Secretary General now, and how many people from Bosnia, for example, uh, know about Reich at all? That's the first question. And the other one, especially uh, as you're from Germany, do you know the statistics, how many young people left uh, Western Balkan countries since the beginning of the Berlin process? And they mostly go to Germany. Second, I don't know how many there are. Maybe you are better informed. And uh, I, I think the most important thing is that we have some uh, points for Jews exchange, for example. And it's something that the, the chairman is, I think, a Kosovar, and, and, and the, the secretary general now is a Serb, and, and, and that something is going on. I, I think it should be our, more our task to publish what they are doing. If the governments don't care too much on, on, on publishing uh, these uh, little supports. Mm. And here we have to find also a way how our missions in the countries can do a better uh, PR uh, also with concrete results, not with some nice uh, thoughts and propaganda. If someone wants to connect, yeah? Okay. I would like to add because, um, of course, it's great that there was this political will to initiate such a large initiative under the umbrella of the Berlin process and then it's the highest political level is involved and uh, it's also great that there is now this uh, multi-ethnic, of course, group of young people who will be uh, uh, leading that and, and, and um, developing the strategy. Um, however, youth exchange and cooperation exists in that region for many, many years. Immediately after the, 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 the wars in the Balkans, there were very successful initiatives developed which are still there and which are ongoing and which are connecting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of young people from all over the region. So we should not think that this exchange and cooperation will only start once the RICO will get operational. Uh, what we have to have in mind and take into consideration is uh, that we have to realize that RICO cannot step instead of all these initiatives now. Mm. It should be in addition to existing, to the existing situation. And that is why I'm personally insist, insisting a lot on mapping out the situation in the region when it comes to youth exchange and cooperation and to build up the strategy of the RICO based on, on the on reality. The data. Not to duplicate, not mm. to spend means on what is not necessary because it's already there. But and so at the end, end <laughs> Berlin process is about to an end in December of next year. What happens next? That's the question for all of you. Maybe you first. Our basic principle is to have the region take the ownership of whatever process there is. Right. We have other processes in parallel, Bordeaux process, for example, where regional leaders are meeting, was ahead of Berlin process. But on one hand, I do expect the EU will seriously focus on the Western Balkan, maybe change, renew somehow the process with an ex commission. On the other hand, yes, in the region, they should take over more commitment and cooperation but it should go hand in hand. This. So to be short, I've heard the next meeting is in London, but it will not be a farewell party. Okay. Ms. Morey. <laughs> well, I am, I am listening to many discussions on this, and I am sure that there will be a follow-up. What I would like to see is a kind of a institutionalization of the process, meaning to introduce some um, monitoring process 
So to really make it a process, not a yearly gathering and a photo session for the political leaders in one of the EU capitals, but uh, a, a serious process which will monitor the progress and also a communication strategy which will then really help some of these major um, decisions and projects to get realized. Thank you all for your time. Dear viewers, that was another Forum Europa. Thank you for your attention. Stay tuned. Poštovani gledatelji, hvala vam puno gledali ste još jedan forum Europa. Hvala na pozornosti i doviđenja.